people in our movement, you know, we don't have a strict rule on alcohol. You know, I have, I have in Christ, you know, hey, new covenant, glass of wine, you know. I've, I, I, it's okay for me to go have a glass of wine, but it's not okay for me to be mastered by it. It's not okay for me to be owned by anything. If I am not free from all these things and available to Jesus, that's on me. Uh, that's why, you know, we're bringing Dave Ramsey's class here. If you're owned by Bank of America, it's hard to have two masters. And, and Paul's teaching is the goal is to, is to not be mastered by anybody except the Lordship of Jesus Christ, which is difficult to do, but that's what he's, he's saying we should strive for. Um, and so just remember this. I, I put you a blank here. On all these things about issues in the church, uh, dealing with disruptions and, and disturbances in the church, remember that when it comes to the control department, you are the only one called to, you are the only person you can control, and you are the only person you're called to control. Self-control. Um, I'm, I'm not good at teaching people lessons. I've shared this with some of you. On 635 in Dallas, if somebody is acting a jerk, and you know how Dallas drivers are, they slow them, and, and I have a moment where, where someone's going to try to get over the last second and exit, what am I tempted to do? Gas it, right? I'm trying to teach them a lesson. All I'm teaching them is what they already think, and that's everybody else on the road is their enemy. It feels good, <laughs> but it's not producing the righteousness of God. It's not, it's not effective. Uh, and, and once we realize that, that ultimately, uh, you know, we aren't, we aren't good at teaching lessons. God is the one that convicts a heart. God is the one that's at work in people's lives. And then our first job, as Paul's saying, the church ought to be able to exercise self-control. The individual needs to start by exercising self-control. Does that make sense? That's why Paul, when he writes to Timothy about leadership in the church, elders ought to be women, or in this case, men, is what Paul says, of self-control, not given over to, to heavy drink, not, not losing hold of his household, but that, that self-control is the first issue. Then we can talk about other things. And that's a full-time job, y'all. If you're spending time controlling other people, odds are you're not spending enough time on your own. So that's where he ends this. It's, it's important for you to know that your job is to, is to have self-control. He talks about the understand, his understanding of marriage of one fleshness uh, and he, he's really obsessed with sexual sin for the Corinthians. Um, he sits on this for a while, and he reminds the he reminds the church that back then that the way the way that you completed a marriage is to is to have sexual intercourse, uh, to become one flesh. That's the spiritual biblical understanding of to be one to be married. And Paul's saying, um, therefore, if you take your body, and he's using self control again, as, or, or this as a self-control issue. If you take your body, which is no longer your body, because you've already united it, you've already gotten married to Jesus in baptism. Remember that? United with Jesus. You're not your own. Uh, I belong to Valerie, too. You know, I, can't, I can't just do whatever I want anymore. You know, that, that went away eight years ago. You, know? uh, you aren't your own only. And so you need to know that when you go off and you do things, that, that uh, you don't have a right to do that. Uh, and and, and uh, Paul even mentions that if you if you're out, you know, have an intercourse with a prostitute, you're married to her. That's his under, that's his teaching of marriage. Um, and so, uh, apparently, one of the issues in that church was was sexual promiscuity. It was doing whatever you want with your bodies. And he ends this this self control piece with just remember this is in verse twenty. You are not your own. You were bought with your with a price. And so he's confronting that whole notion, a false notion of Christian liberty. I can do whatever I want. Well, Paul says, well, technically you can, because you're free in Christ. But that's a really immature way to look at it. Because ultimately, you don't even own yourself. That's a powerful statement. To look at your own hands and say, these aren't even mine. They were, re they were purchased by Jesus. That's where he ends this section. Uh, next week... We are going to fly through 7 through 11, and uh, I'll stick around for comments and uh, arguments and uh, statements, but uh, this, this uh, section of Paul's is, is the most pieced apart in 1 Corinthians, chapter 5 and chapter 6, so we can, I can have fun with it. Okay.
I'll stick around for questions. We've already gone over, but let's pray, and then we'll, we will uh, dismiss. Lord in heaven, we thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for uh, the gift of, of, of interpreting the scriptures together. We pray that, um, that, that as, you, as you uncover these truths for us, that we would know, Lord, uh, which, which of these did Paul say that, that we are to directly apply to our lives and to our ministry, uh, and which are contextual, and show us, Father, in the name of Jesus, in our humility, uh, what is important and how we ought to be and how we ought to act as your church. And may we grab hold of the need to be uh, a, a different option from what the world offers so that we might in turn turn around and, and help transform the world so uh, that we wouldn't be transformed by the world. We love you and we thank you for being patient with us and opening our hearts to these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.